Welcome, everybody. I say with a heavily beating heart that this is a day that we have long been waiting for. So welcome to the first public program hosted by the Center for Netherlandish Art at the Museum of Fine Arts. Applause to, it's going to launch in 2020. The Center will be the first of its kind in the United States. Its mission, simply stated, is to share Dutch and Flemish art with wide audiences, to stimulate research and learning broadly, to nurture future generations of scholars and curators, and to engage the public in appreciation for Netherlandish art. We are an outward-facing research center. You all know, but I say it with, a, with real appreciation, that this center was brought to life through the generosity of two extraordinary couples, Rosemary and Ike Van Otterlo, and Susan and Matt Weatherby, and we're thrilled that you're here with us today. As you know, both couples made landmark gifts of Dutch and Flemish paintings, initial endowment funds, and the Van Otterloos donated a remarkable research library. Through their gifts and the support of many others, we will create a center that generates deep engagement with our community, our academic partners, and broadly speaking, our audiences. We're honored to have Rosemary and Ike, Susan and Matt with us today, and many family and friends. It means a lot to us. We're also honored to welcome two very special guests, the Dutch Ambassador of the United States, Ambassador Henne Schuur, who's with us today, and the cultural attache at the Consulate General of the Netherlands in New York, Joost Tavern. Welcome, both of you. You will not be surprised that in my usual way, I told the ambassador that the guest speaker was not available today and could he speak for an hour on Dutch art. And first of all, the speaker is here. And secondly, uh, the ambassador's answer was yes. Uh, I am also pleased to welcome uh, Wilhelm Schiele, the Dutch Honorary Consul in Boston. Thank you all three of you for being here, truly. I want to end, just before I ask Ronnie Baer to come up to introduce our speaker, to say that the importance of this uh, center, its energy and its purpose, will be that it is connected to our community. And we will define community in many different ways. It will be an academic community. It will be a community of supporters. It will be a community of believers. But in the end, it will be a community because it will respond to the things that we do, including an extraordinary redisplay of our Dutch collection. So again, thank you for joining us. I want now to turn the podium over to Ronnie Baer. I've never said this yet in public. Our former Alfers Senior Curator of European Paintings, we're grateful, Ronnie, to you for your extraordinary service to the MFA, belief in all of its possibilities. And we will watch with admiration as you take on your new position as the Alan R. Adler Class of 1967 Distinguished Curator and Lecturer at Princeton University Art Museum. And it is true that her business card now is four feet long. OK, it just goes like that. But with great uh, admiration and affection, Ronnie Bear. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce one of my most treasured colleagues and friends of long standing, Eric Jan Slauter. Eric Jan is Professor Emeritus of Art History of the Renaissance and Early Modern Period at the University of Amsterdam, where he has served since 2002. Prior to coming to that institution, he taught for many years at Leiden University, where he earned his PhD and enjoyed stints as visiting professor at Yale University, the University of Rome La Sapienza, and the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. His prodigious output of groundbreaking studies is enviable. 
His dissertation was an early consideration of history painting, examining the role of pictorial tradition in 17th century Dutch artists' interpretations of scenes from Ovid's Metamorphosis. In his characteristically generous fashion, he and a group of students curated a major exhibition of the work of Leiden fine painters in 1988. These little known artists were led by Gerrit Dow, the subject of today's lecture. In the early 1990s, Eric Jan and I collaborated on an exhibition devoted to Dow, the subject of my dissertation. Though it didn't come to fruition at that time, he published the essay he had written for our catalog, examining the address by the contemporary art critic and theorist, Philips Angel, to the painters of Leiden in 1641, describing Dow's style and holding him up as the paradigm of painters. All that seems like ancient history, though. Eric Jan's major contributions to the field include seminal articles and books on iconology and the interpretation of Dutch paintings, on artistic rivalry, and on various aspects of the art market. In Seductress of Sight, he examines the themes of beauty and seduction, love and desire, chastity and unchastity in Dutch art. In Rembrandt and the Female Nude, he combined his interest in the great artist and history subjects to produce a beautiful study of Rembrandt's paintings and etchings featuring Andromeda, Susanna, Diana, Danae, and Bathsheba, and their relationships to pictorial tradition. In Rembrandt's Rivals, he examines the art world of Amsterdam in the first half of the 17th century, when Rembrandt was only one of the many painters active in the young nation's capital. He explored emulative imitation among high-life genre painters in the great recent exhibition Vermeer and the Masters of Genre Painting that took place in Paris, Dublin, and Washington in 2017. And he wrote on the ownership of Dutch paintings for our own class distinctions here in 2015. We are extremely lucky that Slaughter is now serving as the 2019 Erasmus Lecturer in Harvard's Department of History of Art and Architecture, and could not have asked for a better inaugural lecturer for the MFA Center for Netherlandish Art. Please join me in welcoming Eric Jan Slauter, whose talk today is entitled Dow and the Art of Deception. Well, thank you, Ronnie, for your very kind introduction. I hope you didn't raise the expectations too high. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about Tao and the art of deception. Um, when, in the 17th century, foreigners visited the cities of Holland, they were always totally perplexed by seeing paintings everywhere around. They were not used to that in their own country, where they only encountered paintings in churches and cloisters or in residences of the aristocracy. Walking around in Dutch cities, however, they had the impression that, they, that everyone had paintings on their walls. Sir Peter Mundy, for example, uh, wrote in his travel diary, and you see it here, as for the art of painting and the affection of the people to pictures, I think none other go beyond them all in general striving to adorn their houses, especially the outer or street room, with costly pieces. Butchers and bakers, not much inferior in their shops, which are fairly sent forth. Yeah, many times blacksmiths, cobblers, etc., will have some picture or other by their forge and in their stall. Such is the general notion, inclination, and delight that these country natives have in paintings. And you see some other nice quotations, and there are many more. And indeed, from the lower middle class up to the rich merchants and wealthy regions, Dutch burghers had many paintings on their walls, which must often have been visible indeed from the street because of the high windows uh, of the forehouse, the street room. Sometimes they had them in truly amazing numbers. 
It's not rare to find probate inventories of households with more than 100 paintings listed in those inventories, especially in wealthy interiors of merchants or well-to-do professionals like notaries, lawyers, uh, university professors, etc. Their walls must have been crammed with paintings. The paintings by Gerrit Dau that will center, take center stage today were part of a collection of 176 paintings distributed all over the house, sometimes 30 to 40 paintings in one medium-sized room. They were owned by a famous professor of medicine in Leiden, Franciscus or François de la Boe Silvius. Here you see his house on the Rapenburg in Leiden that still exists and still has Silvius' coat of, coat of arms in top. Someone like Silvius was a real art, art lover and also connoisseur, who must have been crazy about uh, paintings. And as you heard, such craziness was, according to foreigners, a general disease in this country. But we can be happy that also in our own time there are still people as crazy about paintings as this man was. Had museums existed at that time, I'm quite sure that Silvius, uh, who must have been very proud of his paintings, would have donated his best paintings to a museum. Silvius bought his work mainly from living artists. His collection was very up to date and apart from Gerrit Dau, it contained works by artists such as Paulus Potter, Jan Steen, Jan Davidson de Heem, Jan Porcellus, Philip Zwauerman, Frans van Mieres, Art van, uh, Art van der Neer, Adam Pijnakker, Cornelis, Cornelis van Poelenburg, and Jacob van Ruisdaal, among them. In fact, these are all, which are mentioned, artists which we also find in the Van Ottolo or the Wetherby collections. And at this point, I would like to say um, uh, that I'm extremely honored and very proud that I have the opportunity to present this talk as an inaugural lecture for the new Center for Netherlands Art, which is so generally, generously supported by the Van Ottolo and the Wetherby, uh, we, who are art lovers who have continued to collect paintings in the 17th century tradition and are now making sure that also the tradition will be continued of the study, preservation, and promotion of Netherlandish art in this country, in the United States. By focusing on three paintings by Gerrit Dau, this lecture is also a tribute to my great friend Ronnie Baer, and a farewell pre pre present as well now that she leaves Boston, which is a great loss for Bostonian art lovers. Not only did she play such a crucial role for the position of Netherlands art in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and you will all remember the great exhibition on class distinction, but ever since her dissertation on Gerrit Dau at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York, and the fabulous exhibition, she mentioned it already, she organized in 2000 on this artist in the National Gallery in Washington and the Maurits House in The Hague. Um, since then, uh, she is the great expert on Gerrit Dau. Therefore, it's with some trepidation that I trespass on her territory. <laughs> This fabulous exhibition brought Dao, after a period of relative neglect, back into the center of our image of the Dutch Golden Age, where he truly belongs. In his own time, he was, together with Rembrandt, the most celebrated Dutch painter of the 17th century, whose work were among the most expensive of that period. Therefore, it's a kind of historical adjustment that the Museum of Fine Arts has now received two gorgeous works by this artist. It owned already this wonderful tiny panel with a candlelight scene, one of those specialisms, but now it has been extended with the great self-portrait and this disarming dog at rest, two paintings that shows Dow's great mastery in a magnificent way. In the self-portrait, for example, 
The curtains of heavy tapestry are not only a sign of great wealth and a means to suggest the great master, that the great master is being revealed to us by drawing away the curtains, but they are also meant to show off his uncanny ability in depicting detail. Every warp and weft seem to be visible. But when you look at the painting under a magnifying glass, and you were undoubtedly invited to do so by the owner, I think, you see a great lifeliness in minuscule brush strokes of those extremely fine brushes. And at the same time, we see a breathtaking virtuoso handling of a unifying use of light and shade, which holds together all those dazzling details. The way doubt works with large areas of shadow, with incredible subtle transitions from the deepest shadow to the highest light, sometimes he, something he learned in his youth from his master Rembrandt, that is really unsurpassed, the way how he's able to do that. And you can see that here very well. And this makes that his paintings never look boringly detailed or finicky. For a 17th century colleague and great admirer of Dao, Philips Angel, who wrote in 1642 a short treatise on painting, it was obvious that the main function of painting was to captivate the eye of the art lover through a convincing deception of the eye. And I quote, through the power of the seemingly, re seemingly real, the schijn eigentlijke kracht, a wonderful neology, uh, we, the painters, have to conquer and capture the eye of the art lover, end quote. And in no uncertain terms, Angel makes clear that through captivating the eye, a desire, even a craving for art is aroused. And to achieve this, the painter should strive for a convincing deceit of the eye, oog bedrog, also a beautiful word, uh, or what he also called a semblance without being, a schijn zonder zijn. The notion of the eye being deceived was a true preoccupation of the 17th century viewer. And I quote, For to gape at things as if they actually do exist and to be influenced by them to such an extent, extent that we make believe that they exist, how can that not give us pleasure? Certainly it gives great joy when one is deceived by a false likeness of things." End quote. And this is written by the very learned Johan de Brune. This emphasis on imagining that one sees the real thing when looking at the work of art, uh, and which might sound to us as something for an educated people, that emphasis on really imagining that it's the real thing should be taken seriously. As the very learned Franciscus Junius says, who often echoes the views of connoisseurs of that time, and we find similar utterances with other authors, and I quote, we have to consider it, a painting, with the full attention of our art-loving mind, as if we were confronted with the living presence of the things themselves, and not, without the, with their, and not with their painted portrayal. Time and again, he underlines that you should really set yourself to imagine to the, the real thing and forget that you are looking at the painting. Naturally, this could also be viewed negatively by very orthodox Protestants, for example, who considered paintings, and I quote, an enticing deceit of the eye, openly showing us the real disposition of those who make and possess them, because they thought of painting as a seductress of sight, spellbound by all that's transient, which was therefore, in their opinion, an eye temptation, and food for evil lust and villainous idiocy. <laughs> Nonetheless, the majority of the population was obviously of a very different opinion and had fallen deeply in love with, uh, with this seduction of sight, even a strict Calvinist like our professor Sylvius. 
Two years after his second wife had died in childbirth, Silvius had this painting made by Franz van Mieris, which was described in the inventory after Silvius' death as a painting of Professor Silvius and his wife playing the lute. When contemplating this painting, Silvius would have uh, undoubtedly uh, agreed with Adrian van der Venne's elegant love poem, and I quote, the art of painting awakens a joy in me. Who is able to speak and sing about the merit and fame of such a sweet art, full of benefit and delight, that create out of nothing a beloved sweetheart? Through skillful strokes I see it is true, my love, but speech is missing. I am nevertheless satisfied, my eyes have will and wish, the eyes desire and man longs, the longing dwells the more in me, uh, me all, all the more for this reason, because I see before me an image that has neither body nor speech, nor movement or feeling, a semblance all the same, as though it would turn its face towards mine. We know that Silvius wrote in a moving letter to a friend that his marriage had been a very happy one for both parties because of an unusual harmony of the souls, zila harmony, as he calls it. And this is precisely what Franz von Mieres painted here in a metaphorical way. His deceased wife tunes the strings of the lute while he looks lovingly at her. In this way, Vermeeris presented a wonderful portrayal of marital love through the image of music, which was at that time, and probably still is, the most current metaphor for harmony and love, in pictures as well as in text. For Silvius and for his favorite paintings, painters Gerrit Dau and Frans Vermeeris, this notion of art as deceiving and seducing the eye with all its ambiguities must have been essential. And it was this notion that Gerrit Dau, with great wit, thematized in two of his most ambitious paintings, both owned by Silvius, and now both owned by the Museum Boymans van Beuningen. It is exceptional that uh, we know who the first owning of, owner of such painters was and where they were hanging. Professor Silvius had a new house built on the, uh, on the most fashionable canal in Leiden in 1664. He moved into his house in 1667 when he married his second wife, you saw her, Magdalena Schletzer. Silvius was an internationally renowned professor in medicine and obviously a lover of painter, paintings by the Leiden artists Gerrit Dau and Frans van Mieris, the two artists who produced some of the most expensive paintings on, on the Dutch art market of that time. He owned no less than 11 paintings by Dau and nine by his pu Dau's pupil Frans van Mieris, who was almost as famous as Dau. And the MFA also received a beautiful painting from the Van Ottolo collection by this artist. The three painters, paintings by Dao that I will discuss hung in the most prestigious space of this house, a room measuring about seven and a half by five and a half meters, uh, approximately uh, 25 by 18 feet, which contained 32 paintings. It was the room where guests were received and which held the majority of his most expensive paintings. Uh, Though there were exceptions, uh, because the just ma mentioned painting, which was, of course, personal painting by Vermeeris, was in his own bedroom. But the largest paintings by Gerrit Dau were all in this drawing room, and the three of them and, uh, are described as having painted shutters, which could be opened and closed. Nowadays, no paintings of by Dao have anymore these shutters, and only in one exceptional case they are still together in the Louvre. But many of his most ambitious and expansive paintings had such shutters, doortjes, deertjes, little doors. There were, um, and such shutters emphasized the costliness of the paintings and indicated that they were not meant to be looked at permanently, to look at permanently, but to be revealed before the eyes of guests. To accentuate that they should be viewed with care, 
and should be admired as exceptional masterpieces that would stimulate conversation. Let's have a closer look at these three paintings. The woman at her toilet is dated 1667, the year that Sylvius moved into his new house, directly after his second marriage. In the background of this painting, on the mantelpiece hangs a portrait, which you can hardly see anymore because the background has darkened so much. But it clearly represents a person in the same attitude as in this self-portrait of Dao, now in Kansas City. Originally, it will have been clearly visible as being this same self-portrait, which uh, was, I'm convinced, hanging also in the same room. So Dao portrayed himself in the background, presenting this masterpiece to the, view to the viewer. This portrait, now in Kansas City, is dated 1663. But it must have been retouched and updated in 1667 because it was in that year that the Blauport, the Blue Gate, which was added in the background of the painting, uh, that that building uh, received a spar with that shape. That was in 1667. In X-rays, we can see that the whole open Baldagino, giving a view on this city gate, was painted at a later date. In the first version, Dao had probably shown himself in a window, as he had done, be done before more often. Dao presented himself in the Kansas Spain portrait as a successful, well-to-do burger, not as a painter as in the other two. A burger accentuating his prestige by way of this monumental gallery. And in a post that is an echo of his master's famous self-portrait of 1640, leaning on a balustrade. It seems like a tribute to his master, but also an emulation in Dao's entirely different style, which is truly amazing meticulousness of detail, and a surface that is absolutely smooth and glossy as a mirror. Thus, we are looking here at self-portraits of the two artists who were, in their own time, undoubtedly the most famous Dutch painters, and were both of them very much aware of that. The great master and his first pupil, whose styles had developed in the course of time in two opposite directions, as poles apart. The city big gate in the background which Dao could see from, his own, from the window of his own studio, functions as a kind of vignette for the city of Leiden. It was the most important gate through which visitors to Leiden came into town. Thus, Dao accentuates his local identity as the renowned son of Leiden, the pride of Leiden, which he indeed was, as appears from city descriptions, which were very prestigious books, in which he is always extensively praised. He was even a kind of tourist attraction, as we know from a few diaries. Foreign art lovers visiting Holland hurried to his studio in Leiden to meet this celebrity. We meet with the same city gate with the shape it received in 1667 in the background of the Quack Doctor. This painting is dated 1652. But, like the self-portrait, it also must have been reworked in 1667. Also in this case, we can see in x-rays that considerable changes have been made, such as the addition of this city gate. And also his self-portrait portrait in the window was probably added at that time. I assume that Vesilvius, in the year that he moved into his new house, uh, bought the paintings by the young woman uh, at her toilet, or dated 1667, and that for some reason the other two were still or again in Dao's studio, or that Sylvius had them and gave them to Dao, and that Dao retouched them at that time, all the time at the same time, and adjusted them to each other, adding the blau port in two paintings. Um, and his self-portrait in both the woman at her toilet and the quack doctor, so that he himself is present in all three works. Sylvius, who had eight other paintings by Dao, so 
11 in total, would certainly have appreciated this if you, in this, if you possess these expensive masterpieces, you would like also to have the likeness of the famous master who painted them. With the painting of the woman at her toilet it's in 1667, Dow competes with many of his colleagues who specialized in costly paintings of high life genre. A woman before a mirror had become an extremely popular subject to depict female beauty surrounded by luxury. But Dow gave it an unexpected and witty turn, as we shall see. We see a young woman who is preening herself undoubtedly for a lover, a lover whom, for whom a chair stands ready, and, uh, as well as the wine in the wine cooler. And this lover is, of course, the viewer whose eyes enter the beautiful space this young woman occupies and who is watched by this woman via the mirror. She looks the viewer straight in the eyes. The viewer should fall in love with this illusion of a beautiful woman and will perhaps pay a fortune to possess her, this painting. This truly represents an enticing deceit of the eye, openly showing the nature of those who make and possess the painting, but that meant in a positive sense. The motif of the woman had, uh, with a mirror had already a long tradition and we meet with it in many 16th and 17th century prints in the context of vanity, transience, and pride, the mirror then representing fleeting and false illusion. Here you see, for example, a print by Jacques de Gein from the beginning of the 17th century, in which the woman is literally, literally the center of a quite exhaustive allegory of vanity and transience. She is presented as the epitome of all desirable earthly things. Vanitas vanitatum et omnia vanitas is written on the banderole uh, held by the puto. The mirror functioned traditionally not only in vanitas images, but also in personifications of superbia, the sin of pride, which is of course closely related to vanity as well as of the sense of sight, which is, of course, uh, which is, uh, um, uh, as in, for example, these uh, prints after Hendrik Goltzius. And here you see uh, um, one to the left in which she is shown as a personification with a mirror holding a mirror, and somewhat later one in which the representation of sight is turned into a contemporary scene in which a young man looks with, with a gleam in his eye at a courtesan fondling her breast while she looks in the mirror. The personification has become what we would call a genre scene. It has been brought closer to the viewer's world of experience in a recognizable human situation, portraying a significant aspect of this sense the, dangers of, uh, the danger of seduction by sight. The Latin text underneath contains the moral, saying, when the eyes are not held in check, foolish youth will tumble headlong into evil. The eyes were considered the highest, but also the most dangerous of the senses, which is represented here through contemporary stereotypes about reckless young men, seductive women and the dangers of the sense of sight as easily corrupting the mind by arousing desire in man, which was a real preoccupation at the time. In the 1630s, the theme of a woman with a mirror was picked up by the uh, artists making paintings in contemporary scenes. So it moves from prints to paintings sometimes still with ex explicit references to vanity and transitoriness, as in this exceptional case by Jan Mienz Molenaar. The mirror in the center, a boy blowing bubbles, even a skull under her feet, the terrestrial globe above her head, referring to the image of Lady World, and a contrasting old woman, which literally visualized transitoriness. Oh, I forgot this which literally visualize transients. They all make emphatically clear that this is an image of the vanity and transitoriness of worldly beauty. 
However, in most paintings, explicit references have disappeared so that only the image of a celebration of female beauty remains, such as is these two beautiful later paintings by Vermeer and Frans Vermeerus, both from the 1660s. But associations with vanity and transience would always have been near at hand for the 17th century viewer. And the same holds true for uh, the paintings by the one who really popularized this type of beautiful, elegant young women in, women in wealthy interiors, Gerard ter Borg. And seeing such paintings, we should realize that there is also another tradition of women before a mirror that would have resonated in the contemporary connoisseur's mind, to wit that of Venus looking into a mirror well known from two celebrated paintings uh, of which many copies and replicas must have existed also in the Netherlands. The one by Titian and Rubens' spectacular emulation of Titian's paintings, both poetic images of, beautiful, uh, of, of beauty personified. Exceptional in Dao's painting is that the reflecting surface of the mirror is the focus of the painting, and that this beauty looks straight at the viewer, which we do not find in any other of the genre paintings of, of women before a mirror. Huh? You saw, if you saw a few examples, but which does strongly recall Rubens's painting, of which Dao seems to have known one or of the many copies or replicas. Thus, he wittily transformed Venus into a contemporary beauty. By making the mirror image the focus of his painting, Dao seems to emphasize the comparison between the mirror and the glossy painting, accentuated the notion that painting is like a mirror of nature, uh, which uh, deceives the eye in a pleasurable way, to paraphrase an often quoted uh, line by Sa from Samra van Hoogstraten in his treatise on painting. But at the same time, the painter, painting is, of course, superior to the mirror, Im mirror image because it can hold and preserve the fleeting mirror image. That the young woman watches us via the mirror underlines, however, that we might think that we are looking at a beautiful woman, but that, that we are in fact look at her semblance, at her deceptive image. The woman we imagine as being real and her image, mirror image, eh, which are two levels of illusion, one the woman, the other the mirror, mirror are both semblance with our being. Both are just as much paint on panel. Thou plays in a refined way, refined way with thoughts about the amusing deception which fascinated the 17th century viewer so much. Remarkably, a painting by Rembrandt of a young woman looking into a mirror, which was still in Rembrandt's own possession in 1656, it is described in the inventory of his bankruptcy as a courtesantje zich palierende, a courtesan preening. So it seems to be quite self-evident to see this combination of a woman preening before a mirror as, a, as an image of a courtesan. Rembrandt depicts her with a loose, non-contemporary dress, referring to some imagined past, a kind of fantasy courtesan inspired by Phoenician examples. Dao's young woman is emphatically contemporary. Both the poses, tilted head, and both hands almost touching an ear, the one fingering an earring, the other uh, a string of hair, are remarkably related. But Rembrandt does not show us the mirror image. He demonstrates a very different conception of creating illusion. By turning the mirror with its back towards the viewer, he does not invite us to compare the mirror image and the painting like Dao did. On the contrary, when looking at Rembrandt's painting, one is very much aware of the texture of paint, of the very visual, visible materiality of the brush strokes with which the seemingly breath-breathing skin of the woman is created. 
She seems alive, but simultaneously the paint texture is clearly visible. In great contrast to Dow's image, that through its extremely smooth and shining mirror-like surface wants to deny the materiality of paint. Rembrandt emphasized that illusion is created through matter, through paint. For both, the goal of the art of painting is to create decept deceptive illusion, but their works represent two entirely different conceptions of how to do so. By consciously or unconsciously referring to Rembrandt's painting, Dao uh, underlines the opposite poles that they, these two celebrated masters had come to represent, the, fa and the famous pupil uh, and the master were wide apart in their ways of creating illusion. Dao's wit in crea creating an event that thematizes deception finds its culmination in the largest and most monumental painting he ever made, The Quack Doctor, which must have been the showpiece of Sylvia's reception room. The painting represents a comedy, and like all comedies on the stage, delusion of foolish people is at its core. But this comedy is more pregnant because the maker himself plays a role in his own picture, pictorial deceit, addressing us directly. Depicting a quack doctor and his audience had a long tradition, going back to the early 16th century. It was of old used as an image of deception. Sometimes, as it is underlined in, with words, as in this print by uh, or after Willem Buitenweg, uh, and the line says, beneath people want to be deceived, populus font DGP. The painting by Dao features a number of types that cultured town dwellers felt as far beneath them and were often a source for jokes and all, in all kinds of comedies and farces. The prosperous burger liked to laugh at the supposed stupidity and ignorance of simple people. These stereotypes represented the burger's image of stupidity and foolishness, of people they thought of as lacking reason and judiciousness. We notice a peasant and a poacher, three young maids, an elderly pancake maker and an old market woman and three young boys. The only one who at first sight might seem to be from a higher social standing is the young woman in the background, but the plunging neckline of her dress and the young man with his silly hat gazing into her low décolleté make clear that they are not members of the cultivated bourgeoisie. She would be recognized as a woman of easy virtue. They are all grouped around a quack doctor, whose strange garments would immediately have told contemporary viewers that he is a comic type, a charlatan. Before him lies doctor's diploma with, ridicul with a ridiculously large seal to impress onlookers. The kitchen maid with the cookies and the schoolboy looking out at us are both laughing open-mouthed. They underline that the fact that there's something to laugh here. People laughing function in such paintings as a sign that there is something to laugh about, as a laughing prompt, so to say, like the canned laughter in sitcoms on televisions. So these young people are laughing while the farmer, the poacher, and the market woman are looking with a gullible expression at the quack. What will happen with those people, that they will be cheated out of their money, is underlined by the boy to the right, who dips his hand in the purse of the market woman, who does not realize that she is being robbed. The small boy at the lower left of the group, luring a little bird with a lime stick in his hand, is a witty visual echo of the quack who holds a fake medicine also to lure the ingenuous folk. Immediately below the quack, a pancake maker wipes a toddler's bottom right next to the hot plate and pancakes. A laughing girl bends towards the smelly behind of the child 
and at the same time as putting a brown cookie into her mouth. <laughs> the dirt, sorry, I should have, sorry, sorry, it's here. <laughs> um, there, so there's the girl with the cookie and so on. <laughs> The dirty behind of the child indicates that this man is the, the quack is a cacadoris. In 17th century Dutch, another word for quack doctor. Cock means crap. So it's clear that he's selling crap. His trade stinks, of course, and he himself is a stinker who cons the bystanders. A mid 17th century verse made on a scene with a quack by Adrian Brouwer uh, expresses this thus. Here swaggers an oily Asclepius. One, one hears almost his tongue flapping. How cunningly he makes monkeys of us all. Behold the peasants in his thrall. In Dow's painting, this is almost literally visualized by an ugly little monkey. Uh, scratching its behind, sitting on the table in front of the quack and echoing his master's pose and his master's objective because it's on the point of snatching a coin from the young woman's hand. Esculapian tricks. That thou inserted a pancake woman and the cleaning of the bottom of a child um, in this scene makes clear that he appropriated wittily motifs from a series of print which, were, which comically represents the senses through images of peasant foolishness. Um, to the left you see the motif of a child whose buttocks are being cleaned, while in, the, in this case also another child sits on a pot with the same uh, kind of crap humor, humor in the text. Uh, for the scent, and it says this last line, the sense of smell is a pest that, uh, that children are crapping on pots one finds near hearth and table. In this other, um, no, sorry, that's, um, in the other one, uh, it's, you see the sense of taste with pancake baker, and the text tells there about the distasteful gobbling and gluttony of peasants and their children. So these were all motifs with a long tradition in the depiction of scenes of peasants. And upgrading the types, Dao inserted them cleverly in his painting. In the, window, in, the, in the window of the inn, we recognize Dao himself. The palette immediately identifies him as a painter. Now it's out of the question that Dao would ever have painted in an inn. But it recalls the story by Vermander about Peter, Peter Bruegel, who often would have mingled with, the pe with peasants. And I quote here, Vermander writes this, to see them eating, and he did so, to see them eating, drinking, jumping, making love, which things he then knew how to imitate in a comical and characteristic way, and to represent this foolish nature of peasants in a very natural manner when dancing, standing, walking, or in other actions, end quote. And with this anecdote, Van Mander meant to kind of guarantee that Bruegel was really a close observer of life itself. Huh? He saw it all happening and could, and then faithfully imitated it, that he was a faithful imitator of life itself. And Dow seems to have done the same by including himself as an infrequenting bystander, which he probably was not. That the most expensive painting in the reception room of this internationally famous professor of medicine was a scene of a quack doctor says something about his sense of humor. <laughs> this is emphasized by the fact that the first painting that one probably saw when entering the house was also a scene of a quack, by no other than Adrian Brouwer. A quack by Brouwer uh, was the first painting recorded in the inventory when the paintings hanging in the entrance hall are enumerated in that inventory, which was usually done clockwise from the door through which one entered the spa a space. So I'm quite sure that this was the first painting you saw. 
It might have been this painting now in Karlsruhe, which is possibly also the painting on which the poem was made that I just quoted. It's even possible that Dao owned the painting himself and that it has stimulated him to make his own painting of a quack in the, in the first place. And then, after adding the self-portrait, sold them both to Sylvius. The basic scheme of the arrangement of the figures uh, going up towards a wall obliquely receding into space, featuring, featuring a window with a figure leaning out, is remarkably similar. For Sylvius, these, uh, uh, for, uh, these scenes of quacks would have been witty counter images of himself, suitable for the entrance hall and the main room of a sharp witted professor in medicine. Sylvius was, in fact, one of the greatest reformers of the medical science in Europe and an innovative advocate of the new empirical science. His conviction was that nothing in the medical science could be taken for true if it was not proved by empir empirical observation, which was new at that time. He was also a famous practicing physician who was consulted by many princes in Europe why he was simultaneously well known for making no distinction between, poor and the between the poor and the rich. It was said that he did not withhold the poor expensive uh, drugs if they needed them. In Dow's painting, we see in every way, of course, the opposite. The medical doctor as a swindler misusing the ingenuousness of simple people, cutting money out of the pockets of the uneducated who were supposed to be easily deluded because they were thought to rely on their senses only. For Sylvius and his guests, the painting uh, was without doubt a source of both jocular and witty conversation. And it is this audience that Dow addresses, leaning out of the window and with an amused expression looking at the viewer, seemingly asking our opinion about, his com about this coming deceit of the quack and about the deception, deceptive illusion with uh, which the painter presents here. The emphasis, the, the emphatic placement of the painter next to the quack will have reminded, moreover, the erudite viewer that both quack and painter were children of Mercury. We find them in, in each other's company in series of prints of the so-called children of the planets. Such allegorical prints, series representing cosmic influence on human lives, like series of the elements, the seasons, and the planets, were very popular in the 16th century and many motifs lingered on in the 17th century. The planets were represented by the gods who, uh, whose name they were, Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, Saturn, Mars, together with the types of people born and influenced by those planets. Now, Mercury was the god of quick intelligence and especially of eloquence, but also of lies and deceit. For that reason, he was the patron god of, uh, so to say, of honorable merchants, of scholars in the liberal arts and the sciences, and of artists, all people who needed a quick and sharp intelligence and have to convince others by eloquence, verbal or pictorial eloquence. But Mercury is also the patron of thieves and swindlers who have to do their job by way of intelligence and the power of eloquence and persuasion as well, and through cunning and deceit. One of the best known depictions you see here, and uh, it was very well known then and still is, uh, that is this beautiful invention after Hendrik Goltjes, in which you see the learned scholars arguing in the foreground. Uh, they have here the leading role, but we immediately also see the painter standing before his easel, and between the painter and his easel we find the laboring sculptor, and behind him the quack who is trying to pass off the little his little bottles to an audience of peasants. An amusing painting of the Children of Mercury by Sebastian Frank shows in the first place a merchant in the foreground, 
um, a wine merchant and a client making a deal that's probably not sound. Apparently, the buyer does not see things too sharply because there is a peddler offering him, him glasses. Uh, and the woman at the left buys a print uh, with a print seller, but in the meantime, a little boy is picking her purse. We also see a stage which com with comedians to the right, and the quack and his audience is in the middle uh, before the monumental, uh, be before this uh, column. Finally, to the right, in this sophisticated architecture, uh, monumental architecture, with a statue of Mercury before it, we find the sculptor and the painters sitting before his easel. Some motifs return in Dow's painting. And it seems obvious that he wittily inserted this tradition of the children of Mercury in his work, and that that will be recognized by the real connoisseurs. He probably knew a scene such as the one by Franks or one of, similar, one of a similar type. But Dow places himself next to the quack doctor, asking us for comparison. Two children of Mercury, two deceivers, who are both able to sell their deceptive illusion because of their sharp wit and eloquent persuasiveness. But he does not sell his deceit to the foolish and the uneducated. He extorts a lot of money from sophisticated and wealthy art lovers, like Sylvius. Connoisseurs who are willing to pay fabulous prices for this pictorial deceit. Connoisseurs who amuse themselves with being deceived, imagining to see things that are not there, and simultaneously being offered a rich source for a witty conversation and, uh, about the relation between deceit of the quack and the true medicine, medicine, medical sciences, a conversation about the nature of delusion of the quack and of that of the painter, or um, about the qualities of the children of Mercury, the more so because this uh, serious doctor was also one of them. Um, and of course, in general, uh, a conversation about truth, truth and illusion. And Dow makes clear that all his paintings, complex or simple, but all painted by one of the most celebrated masters of the 17th century, were meant to conquer and capture the eye of the art lover through the power of the seemingly real, the schijn eigentlijke kracht. Thank you. Thank you so much for an extraordinary lecture which reminds us of the seriousness of what we do presented in such an elegant way. It was a pleasure to have you as our inaugural lecturer. Thank you so much. And now it's a privilege to ask the ambassador to come up and just share with us a few thoughts. Well, I can tell you I'm very happy that uh, I was not put on the spot. Uh, <laughs> and although we are paid to, to talk, and the rule is always you put a quarter and he talks for an hour, uh, this uh, was for me also very interesting. I, I come from Leiden, I studied in Leiden. I know the house um, and uh, to have, be here and listen to a uh, conversation about Gerrit Dau is uh, a wonderful start of what we think is a wonderful initiative. Um, I'm here um, to celebrate um, the remarkable gift of the, uh, the Mol van Otto family and the Wetherby family. Um, I'm here to celebrate two families, two two couples um, who have done something. You talked about the shutters 
on the paintings and that the shutters only would open the moment that your friends would be there and you would take off the shutters to show the paintings to your real, real friends. These two couples will take the shutters of their paintings by giving their paintings to a museum as this wonderful museum and basically saying to all of us who will visit this museum, you are my friend and I share the thing that I've bought, the thing of beauty that I've bought, I want to share with you and I think that's a remarkable gift and I, I really applaud you for that. I also am here because a long time ago, not a long time ago, a couple of decades ago, um, uh, Jean Monnet, one of the, the architects of the European Union, was asked if you would do it all over again and you would build a united Europe, would you do the same thing that you did? Would you start with the, the coal and steel uh, as two, um, two elements that would uh, bind people together? And his answer was no. I would start with culture. There's nothing that binds people so much together and there's nothing that stimulates finding what connects you uh, as culture. So that's why I'm so very, very pleased to see here now being established an institute for Netherlandish art. An institute that not only will teach people about the Dutch, the Flemish culture, and I hope not only of the 16th, 17th century, but all of our, all of our studies and, um, and all of our, our, our history, um, but also I think will bind together in this way the American people with the Dutch people. We came here in 1609. Uh, we had hired a British captain to find a passage to India. And you know what, when he was halfway through the Hudson, he realized that his book that he has written was probably not totally accurate. <laughs> uh, and, and he established himself, or he established us in, in New York. That teaches you never to hire British captains. <laughs> And anyway, in six, since 1609, we have had a, a, a relationship with this country and a relationship of friendship. And 1609, of course, was the period of the golden age, the period of where these paintings come from. Uh, and it's wonderful to go back to that period and make a gift of paintings of that period, uh, which is the highlight in our history and, and show the American people and show this fine city which has a clear link with uh, uh, the Netherlands. Your second president was your first ambassador uh, uh, to, uh, to the Netherlands which has that link uh, and show these people in this city this is what the Netherlands was at that time and this is what we still are. We are still the friends that came to you in the 17th century uh, and uh, we still have so much to offer to you and we still have such a connection uh, with the United States. I'm here for a second reason and a very special reason. Um, you have done, both of you, the Weatherbees and the Molten Otelo have done something special. Uh, and um, as I said, it's more than just a gift. It's you have invested in the relationship between the Netherlands and the United States. Um, you have done something, and I tell it with all humility, that no embassy can ever do. Uh, you have done something that will last for a lot longer than any embassy or any ambassador uh, will ever be able to do. Um, therefore, um, King William Alexander has decided to bestow on you the knighthood as knight in the Order of Orange Nassau. And that's the real reason.
And that's the real reason why I'm here, and that's why... <laughs> although the other one was a, was a nice extra, I must say. <laughs> and therefore, I would like to come up to uh, the stage uh, to, uh, that I can pin the order on you. Please come up. boxes uh, and there's the ritual uh, I have to I have to make sure that I give everybody the right one this is it. you know what I'll give it to you All because right. if I'm always uh, it's, it's, it's dicey here really. it's dicey here <laughs> Does it work? Yeah. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. You've done this before. Right? I've done this before, but I've drawn, uh, drawn blood also. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. oh. Male and female, I hope that you see that. <laughs> I won't explain what the difference is. I can tell you, I've been ambassador for four years. Um, I had the privilege of extending this honor four times in the past four years. We are a stingy people, we <laughs> Dutch. We don't give away our orders easily. Uh, I'm wildly happy, not only that I could have, that I have been able to double my total, uh, <laughs> but also to have been able to give it to you because I honestly say that what you have done and the gift that you have given and the institute that you have created which ensure that we will be here in this city for generations to come has been remarkable and I don't think that any order was as deserved as what I just gave you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.